All right, we are live. All right, great. So we are back. It is still February 10th and we are going to, we're, we're gonna talk about S42. Um, Katie has provided us with the, what we were hoping would be the final draft. And I think I shared with you, and it's also on our webpage, um, two communications. One, a communication from uh, Sam Liss asking us to add Dale folks um, onto the first responder list for the commission. And then we have a, a note from Monica Hutt, commissioner of Dale saying that she had not heard about this and it was, uh, she didn't feel it was necessary from her perspective. Then I did reach out as well to um, James Baker, his group, and uh, their, their comment is that this is the first time that this person or, the, and obviously not Dale, but his organization um, has the employee assistant program for, uh, Voc rehab, I guess, but this is the first time that they have heard from these folks and that they were not at all involved at the first um, conference that was held that sort of promulgated the bill. So with all of that said, and I now open it up for discussion, I mean, I I think this is a this is a, a very late in the request, and given that there isn't a lot of support for it except for the person who requested it, that if this were going into the bill, this would be something that the House can debate. Unless anybody here feels strongly about this, go ahead, Ruth. Senator Hardy. No, I, I agree with you, um, Senator Lyons, and I, I was going to ask that we reach out to Commissioner Hutt, and so I'm glad that she sent in her note, um, because she's but, we've had her in committee a couple times, and she's never mentioned this, so um, no. thank you. Yeah, so I, I was right in the process of drafting an email for her, to her about this, when I got an email from her saying she had... Um, seen it so anyway anyone else we're are we good with not having this but the message is and i you know someone is watching on youtube or folks who are interested in this and want to make a case for it uh once the bill goes to the senate and we pass it over to house uh human services yes goes to human services i believe once it gets there, then there's adequate time, I would think, to um, ask to be put on the agenda. So it's very late in our game, and I think we're we're ready to vote on the bill. So that's where we are. Is anyone not would would someone like to put forward a motion on S42 as drafted? And what draft is it? We should check. 2.1, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yep. 2.1. It and still would... has it still has the yellow in it, but that would disappear. So I don't think that changes the draft number. Jen, can I ask you a professional question? Are you there, Jen Carby? Yeah. So Sorry. If we have a bill that we're that we like all the language, but it still has some highlighting in it, it the, the, taking the highlighting away doesn't change the draft number, does it? I mean, it's really up to the attorney's discretion. I think you could uh, you could vote on a new draft number and ask that it be cleaned up, or you could vote on it as is and ask that she take out the highlighting and not change the number. Okay, so that's very definitive. Okay. I mean, so so you could so so I think you can vote on it without the without the color coming off. You'll just need to decide okay. which way you want to do it. 
Terrific. So usually, I, usually I make an, I think I make a clean one just so that there aren't two, two drafts that purport to have the same number that are actually look different, but I don't know how other people do it. So I don't want to. So this is Katie. Do you happen to know how she does it? No, but I think okay. if you wanted to make it a, whatever, what? if you're voting out 2.1 and you want to make, you want to vote out 2.2, which is the same as 2.1, except without the highlighting, we can communicate that to her. Okay, I'm All happy right, to uh, that. <laughs> what, so what's your, what's your proposal? <laughs> that we, I, I would move that the, um, the committee approve version 2.1 or 2.2, which is identical to 2.1, except for without the yellow highlights. So that we ask Katie to do a new draft with that, just to keep it consistent. Um, so I would make a motion for the committee to approve that 2.2. Same as 2.1, no yellow. Perfect. I will send okay. that to her a note right now, letting her know that's what you're voting. <laughs> oh, good. Thanks. She'll say what? All right. Um, so, Mr. Clerk, we, uh, we don't need a second for this. Um, okay. So, Senator Terenzini is our clerk. So, uh, is there any discussion before... He calls a vote. Seeing none, Senator Terenzini. Thank you. I have my uh, sheet here. And um, at this time, I'll call for the, the question. Uh, and I would start with myself. Uh, and I am a, a yes on this uh, bill. And I would go to uh, Senator uh, Hooker at this time. Yes. Senator uh, Cummings. You're mute. You're mute. I've got it. Yes. Senator Hardy. Yes. Senator Lyons. Yes. Uh, by my tally, the ayes have it, a five to zero uh, committee vote for version 2.2 .2 of S42. Excellent. Thank you. That's great. So um, I, I will say now, the Senator Cummings reported this bill last session, and I would offer her first divs on it. But I also know that if there is someone who is very new to the Senate and the Senate process and the committee, uh, that this is a bill that might be less challenging, shall we say, than some of the others that we're going to see. So um, is there anyone on the committee that would like to report the, that with that sort of description? As Senator Cummings, you had indicated that you're happy passing it off to uh, I am someone very there. happy passing it off. Okay. Um, I'll have a couple complicated bills from my other committee, so. All right. Well, we'll get you Good some thing. complicated ones from this committee, how's that? It's getting right. better every day. All right, so. When, um, Senator Lyons, uh, when, when would uh, this bill be reported on the Senate floor? When might that happen? So the, the next step is that the reporter would take the vote, uh, send the vote and the clean draft so you'd have to get that from Katie uh, and send that to John Bloomer, Secretary of the Senate and just indicating the vote and this is the bill and I'm the reporter. Then that would go up to the Senate. If we did that today, it could be on the notice calendar as early as tomorrow. Uh, so then the reporting for the second read would be on Friday. If there's any delay in that process, you know, so for example, Katie can't get the bill back, then it might be delayed until Tuesday next. So that, that's, that's the timing of it. Senator Terenzini, are, are, if you're not comfortable reporting a bill yet, because I don't know that you've seen any bills reported. Um, I'm happy to do this bill so you can see it, but otherwise it is an easy bill to start your first report. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, I, I, 
I was thinking exactly that. I, th I do think it is not a bad thing. So Josh, are you comfortable with a reporting? Yeah. Yeah, I think I am. I would just probably have a side conversation with you at some point. Just happy to, to do it. You know, right, let's review do that. the finer details. So I can. So on on this sheet for, um, I would be the reporter, Nelly. Yes. Or Senator Lance. Okay. Yes, and then what you need to do then, Nelly, will provide you with a list of witnesses. Okay. And then. You have all the testimony and why don't you and I plan right after this meeting is over at 12 o'clock, we'll spend five minutes together okay. before we get off Zoom. All right. No problem. Sounds good. All right. Thank you all for your work on this bill. It, it's, it's, it's so it's a critically important bill. There's no question. And uh, it's been great. Okay. That's our first bill out. Um, and I know, here's what, here's what I also say. I think each one of us would really love to report the bill. <laughs> and you each will have a bill. So we'll see what happens. Um, well, I again, appreciate the opportunity to uh, do it, Senator Lyons. So thanks well, for you be careful. nudging we'll, we'll me. Talk, we'll talk. We'll talk. <laughs> OK. Um, Jen Carby is here and what I, you know, what we, we're starting to get a lot of different bills in committee and it has been, I think, an interest, at least of mine, to cover some of the bills that we passed last year and to get them back on their way because they are important to a number of folks. And so I asked Jen, I didn't know that we'd have quite this much time, but it, we might need it, to walk through S-22 uh, with us. And just to point you, when you get some time, um, I've been looking for uh, news articles and other articles on stem cells. And at the same time, Jen's been looking. And so you'll see a little, an article, it's under my name. Um, but so we're both responsible uh, for the Missouri law, lawmaker sell, selling fake stem cells. That's an interesting article. Um, and I will have other articles as we move along with this bill, but um, some are not as sort of popularized as that one. All right, so Jen, I'm the sponsor of the bill. I don't need to say a word. Uh, let's just go through the bill. Uh, and maybe if you could share with us as you're doing that, some of the complexity that we've removed from the bill. I, I don't know if you want to do that right now. Uh, let's just go, let's just go through it. You go through it. Use okay. your best judgment. Okay. Um, great. So I'm sharing my screen again. You yep. should be seeing S. 22, um, and I think the, the statement of purpose, so the first sentence sort of sums up what the bill is, um, the main part of the bill is doing. And it, so it says the bill proposes to require healthcare practitioners who administer stem cell products that are not approved by the US Food and Drug Administration to provide notice of this fact to their patients and in their advertisements and to provide a disclosure form to each patient prior to administering any non-FDA approved stem cell product. And then at the end, it would also direct the Department of Health to amend its rules on advanced directives to further clarify the scope of experimental treatments to which an agent may and may not provide consent on behalf of a principal. So it is called an act relating to healthcare practitioners administering stem cell products not approved by the FDA. U.S. Food and Drug Administration. It would create a new chapter in Title 18 on stem cell products. And it starts with a couple of definitions. The first is a healthcare care practitioner, which is an individual licensed by the Board of Medical Practice or by a board attached to OPR to provide professional health care services in this state. And then the big definition here um, is of stem cell products. And it says it has the same meaning as human cells, 
tissues or cellular or tissue-based products in federal regulation as in effect on a date certain and applies to both homologous and non-homologous use. The term also includes homologous use of minimally manipulated cell or tissue products as those terms are defined in the same federal regulation as an effect on the same date when used or proposed for use in one or more applications not approved by the FDA. Um, and I will talk a little bit more about this after we do the walkthrough and let you know where, where I am with things on the definition. I do think the definition may need some additional attention. Um, so I wanna flag that for you, but I'll let you know what I'm trying to do about it. Um, all right, so then we get to section 4502 on approved stem cell products, notice and disclosure. So the first piece of this is on notice. It requires a healthcare practitioner who administers one or more stem cell products not approved by the FDA to provide each patient with the following written notice prior to administering any such product to the patient for the first time. And the notice would say, this notice must be provided to you under Vermont law. This healthcare practitioner administers one or more stem cell products that have not been approved by the US Food and Drug Administration. You are encouraged to consult with your primary care provider prior to having an unapproved stem cell product administered to you. The written notice must be at least eight and a half by 11 inches and printed in not less than 40 print point type and include information on methods for filing a complaint with the applicable licensing authority and for making a consumer inquiry. It also requires the healthcare practitioner to prominently display the written notice along with the information required to be included about how to file a complaint and uh, make a consumer inquiry at the entrance and in an area visible to patients in the healthcare practitioner's office. That's the notice piece. And then the disclosure piece requires a healthcare practitioner who administers stem cell products not approved by the FDA to provide a disclosure form to a patient for the patient's signature prior to each administration of an unapproved stem cell product. The disclosure form must state in language that the patient could reasonably be expected to understand the stem cell products US Food and Drug Administration approval status. The healthcare practitioner must retain in the patient's medical record a copy of each disclosure form signed and dated by the patient. That's the disclosure piece. And then advertisements. This would require a healthcare practitioner to include that notice in the first part of the section in any advertisements relating to the use of stem cell products that are not approved by the FDA. In print advertisements, the notice must be clearly legible and in a font size not smaller than the largest font size used in the advertisement. For all other forms of advertisements, the notice must either be clearly legible in a font size not smaller than the, small, the largest font size used in the advertisement or clearly spoken. Then we have a couple of non-applicability provisions. Provisions of this section do not apply to a healthcare practitioner who has obtained approval or clearance for an investigational new drug or device from the FDA for the use of stem cell products or to a healthcare practitioner who administers a stem cell product pursuant to an employment or other contract to administer these products on behalf of or under the auspices of an institution certified by the Foundation for the Accreditation of Cellular Therapy, the National Institutes of Health Blood and Marrow Transplant Clinical Trials Network, or AABB, formerly known as the American Association of Blood Banks. Violations of this section constitute unprofessional conduct under both the OPR and Board of Medical Practice statutes. Then we go into those statutes. So here's the OPR one, uh, and this would give, uh, would add to the list of what constitutes unprofessional conduct for a healthcare practitioner failing to comply with one or more of the notice, disclosure, or advertising requirements set forth in the section we just looked at for administering stem cell products not approved by the FDA. And similarly for the Board of Medical Practice, the board would find uh, as unprofessional conduct, uh, failure to comply with one or more of the notice disclosure or advertising requirements in that section for administering stem cell products not approved by the FDA. 
And then finally, that last piece around advanced directives would direct the Department of Health to amend its advanced directive rules to further clarify the scope of experimental treatments to which an agent may and may not provide consent on behalf of a principal with the amended rules taking effect not later than January 1st, 2022. And this act would take effect on July 1st of this year. So that is the language itself. And then just to, to keep you most current on uh, my activities, I actually was able to, thanks to a, um, uh, an email notice from David Hurley at the Board of Medical Practice about a um, FDA, some FDA regulators presenting a seminar yesterday or webinar, uh, I was able to attend. And it was all about um, the FDA's regulatory role over human cell and tissue products. Um, so that was, that was interesting. Uh, a lot of jargon went over my head, a lot of the terms that were in that definition. But they, one of the things that they said that the presenter said was that they're happy to work with people. I think they mostly thought they were talking to med, uh, state medical practice boards, but um, anybody who has questions about the language or how to interpret it. So I sent them a lengthy email this morning with a link to the bill and the definition and said, I'd love it if you'd help me. So I will, I will keep you posted on whether and what I hear back. <laughs> Terrific. Uh, and I, so, and, and just, <laughs> oh, excuse me. I, I think we're all ready to vote this bill out. No, I'm S Senator Cummings took me seriously. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, you, you didn't say that we did do this bill last year. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Uh, yeah, so there's there, there's a lot in this bill and um, we'll we'll have to sort through it all. On February 23rd, just FYI, there's a, there is a, a, the National Regenerative Medicine Group is having a, a forum and I've been invited to be on the panel. So I'll be doing that. Um, it certainly will be fun talking about the bill itself. So, um, so here's, here's what I'd like to ask you first. Um, do you have questions for Jen. And before I open it up for questions, just want to add one thing. <clears throat> this whole area of medicine uh, and uh, is, is, is just filled with research and new research. It's entrepreneurial. There's a lot of hope that's offered here uh, for folks, but there's also a lot of um, potential for uh, misuse of information, uh, medical information and within the medical environment. So our, what we're trying to do based on a request from some folks who will be testifying, is we will try to sort out a distinction and what works legislatively. Last year we felt, and we got to a place where the notice provision was, uh, was, was, the, was the right thing to do. And I don't know whether we'll hear, hear any further from our experts on whether or not there's more that we have to do. So <clears throat> just to let you know that this is, this is an area of work where people feel like there's a lot to be offered for stem cell therapy and adding stem cells, building new tissue, repairing tissues that are diseased and so on. There's also the possibility of using it when it isn't called for. And I do have an article uh, in addition to the one that, that is on the web page. There's also an article about how it's been used selectively during COVID to, to, for people to think that this is going to cure COVID, so the, the uh, virus. So there, this is a real cutting edge place for us to be working on. So Senator Hardy. I think Senator Hooker had a question. I, I can wait for her first. All right, go right ahead. Thank you. I just had a question about the advertisements. Am I reading this correctly where it says um, in print advertisements, the notice shall be clearly legible and in a font size not smaller than the largest font size used in the advertisement. I mean, so how does that play out? I mean, if you have a font size that's, you know, 
40 or 50 or 60 or whatever it is. And the notice has to be at least that big. It, is that okay? I mean, I'm fine with it. <laughs> Senator you Cummings, do you want to comment paper? on that? No, I, <clears throat> we spent a lot of time on this last year. I think I'm coming out of the full page ads in my local newspaper that were playing weekly at least each week for a different condition you might have that this therapy would cure. And I think in an ad like that, you know, where the, the opening letters are three inches high, it might be a little extreme, but I think we didn't want to put it in point zero so that you would need a magnifying glass. But where that happy medium is, right? I don't know. I think we'd get pushback from the guys if we told them, you know, you had to have an equal headline that says, come down and try our therapy. And oh, by the way, it's a quack. I mean, <laughs> snake oil. Yeah. It's snake oil. Wait, no, so it's, it's, it's not approved by the FDA. It's not, not approved, approved by the FDA. Yeah. But so, that, I, I, mean, I had a, a constituent last year who um, answered that ad, that type of ad, had the treatment and was charged $10,000. Yes. That is one of the issues. And that not, is one of the issues. At a time. So, yeah, there were two women that went blind from having things inserted into their eyes. That was on the news, I think in Maine, but about the time we took this bill up. Yeah, we, we do, we can uh, get the testimony we had last year. Um, it's it's right, still out there on our webpage. If you go to the last year's um, session, last session. What does this do about the guys who are centrifuging your own blood and putting it back in? Oh, well, we're going to have to get testimony about that. They were all over us last oh, year. Oh, yes, they were. Well, so we'll, we'll invite, we'll invite all of the testimony. Senator Hardy, you've been thank patient. You. Uh, thank you. Um, this reminds me of a bill we did in agriculture that required a notification and we had the signs in our room and we were looking at them and comparing font and I think Mike or Grady we almost drove him crazy with it so Jen be prepared we're gonna have you. <laughs> um, no but I, Mike I printed out one last time I yeah. don't know if the two people who were on the committee remember but it pretty much filled the page with just the, yes, the 40 did. point exactly. eight, 40 point font on eight and a half by eleven yeah that's depends on the goal depends on the goal doing and ag too, it, to visualize it, it's helpful. Um, but, but I do have a question, Jen, um, which um, I'm sure we'll get to in testimony, but I'm, I'm not familiar with the interplay between a licensed medical practitioner and their ability or inability to do sort of experimental practice. Um, uh, you know, I know that there are official studies that are done through the auspices often of medical schools and things like that, and they have a lot of regulations surrounding them. But can a regular doctor just use experimental therapies in general without going through separate processes? Or are we... I, I, maybe the maybe the bill is answering my question. We're creating the special processes they have to go to, but what what already exists just sort of generically. Let's, um, I think. Go ahead, Jen. You can you no, can answer well, for yourself. But most of my most of my answer was going to be a deflection. I mean, I think in general, it's sort of what falls within the scope of practice right. for the particular practitioner, and that's you know a lot of that is up to the regulatory boards. Um, so I don't know that I can give you a. a a clear answer about what is and what is not uh, permissible, but I would encourage you to hear from them. Right. I know. I think uh, you've asked a really loaded and good question that is going to be answered as we go through a significant amount of testimony. Senator Cummings. Last time we dealt with this was Lyme disease and the standard practice and the new practices. And we actually told 
the board of medical practice that they had to allow it, which didn't set really well, but that was an experiment. There were just new treatments and people were having to go out of state for the treatment for Lyme disease. But Thank you for reminding us of that. Yes, that, that's a good analogy. Yeah, good example. Josh, Senator Terenzini. Thank you, Senator Lyons. Um, you know, obviously just my first exposure to this bill. Um, no questions this time, but this is sort of what I call a, a no-brainer. Uh, in, in my book that we would want to have some type of protection and law in the books uh, about this. So I look forward to hearing more, but you know, I mean, the first page pretty much says it all to me. So uh, thanks for uh, introducing this. Yeah. So, I mean, you, when you look at it today, it, it does make uh, some sense to have it in place. I will say uh, the last time it was introduced, it got, tangled up in a web and we took us time to untangle it. So, so a lot of the a lot of the heavy lift has been done for us, but we will we will nevertheless we'll bring folks in to testify uh, who can clarify the language that's in the bill. So we'll all become experts in stem cell therapy and stem cells and immunology and all those things. And then we'll um, we'll 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 ask the questions about scope of practice and so on. So, um, any other questions for Jen? Wow. I, I, okay, so um, we will set this up for testimony um, fairly soon. And we, because we, but we also have some other bills that we'll be setting up uh, to look at next week, but I'm gonna try and get some testimony in on this one as quickly as we can. And I know that there, there, are, there are some experts out there uh, in particular at UVM where this kind of research is ongoing and the treatment is ongoing. There's also a, a practitioner, uh, I believe he's still in Winooski uh, who testified last time and was very concerned about limiting his practice. So we'll try to find him again um, and then others. So, all right, Jen, is there another bill we could go through that we don't have on the agenda? Let me see. Oh, I thought we could just spend a few more minutes, make 15 more minutes with a bill. That would be good. Um, I have you down tomorrow for flavored products. So let's leave it there. Okay. <clears throat> what else? Um, Senator Lyons, where are we at with the nurse compact bill? Are we, are we, we're, going we're doing a deep that? dive on that tomorrow. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the, if you look, let's just do that together for a minute. If you look at the agenda, you'll see the first thing we're doing. Um, Amron couldn't be here till 920. So we'll begin with some discussion. Um, and then we'll deep dive through the nurse compact. Then we're gonna look at uh, the next bill. And then we'll, on Friday, we're doing testimony on the nurse compact. So that should help, <clears throat> excuse me, with that bill. Then next week, we're gonna be picking up, I may as well uh, share with you now, we'll be picking up the uh, flavored tobacco products and e-liquids bill. Uh, we've got witnesses test, uh, scheduled to testify on that. Then the other bill that, um, there are other bills that we should look at. Katie will take us through the PFAS bill uh, and the climate change response planning through the planning commissions. And I'm looking at the bills that we might ask Jen to look at today. Um, wow, are you, did you do the S74 that Senator McCormick introduced? Yep. 
how about doing that? That's a technical corrections bill. So it's not, it's maybe more straightforward than some of the others that I'm looking at. Let's try that. We should have Senator McCormick come in and we will, but let's just, we'll go through it preliminarily and then we'll invite him in at some point to introduce the bill. <clears throat> okay, I'm, shall I put the bill up? Yes, please. All right, so I'm uh, reluctant to call anything technical corrections unless it is literally fixing a mistake or, um, uh -oh. or changing words like here and before to actually include a cross-reference. So I'm not calling this, you may call it a technical <laughs> correction. I'm not calling back. this technical I'll corrections. Um, but it does make some choices to the patient choice at end of life law. Um, so again, I've tried to kind of sum it up here in the statement of purpose. It proposes to eliminate a requirement in Vermont's patient choice at end of life laws that both oral requests required of the patient with a terminal condition for medication to be self-administered to hasten the patient's death. So that's what we're talking about here. Uh, must have been made in the physical presence. It would eliminate the requirement that those requests have been made in the physical presence of the physician to whom the patient made the request. It would eliminate a requirement that the prescribing physician have conducted a physical examination of the patient in order to determine that the patient was suffering a terminal condition and a requirement that the physician must have waited at least 48 hours after the occurrence of certain required events before writing the prescription. And it would also provide immunity for any person who acts in good faith compliance with the provisions of the patient choice at end of life law. So that's the, the summary, but it's what you're about to see. The first changes come in, in section one are in uh, the requirements for prescription and documentation. Um, so for those of you who were not involved in um, the passage of the patient choice at end of life laws, which are sometimes referred to as death with dignity or physician assisted suicide, um, the way they are written is really through the, the provider, the physician lens. So it talks about a physician not being subject to civil or criminal liability or professional disciplinary action for prescribing to a patient with a terminal condition medication for self-administration by the patient for the pur purpose of hastening the patient's death. Uh, and that, so, so no liability or disciplinary action if the, patient, if the physician prescribes the medication to the patient and the physician affirms by documenting in the patient's medical record that a number of events occurred. So that's the way it's framed. So, um, so the first is that the patient made an oral request to the physician, and this would eliminate the language that requires that to be in the physician's physical presence. So this would still require the patient to make an oral request for medication to be self-administered for the purpose of hastening the patient's death, but not require it to be made in the physician's physical presence. Um, and, and similarly, uh, that there be a second oral request uh, again, would not have to be in the physician's physical presence. And then this change up here on line 13 really is a technical one. It's just changing it from no fewer to not fewer for uh, improve the grammar. Um, so that's that first piece is eliminating the physical presence requirement. Um, then we skip down to the physician's determination that the patient was suffering a terminal condition that would be based on the physician's examination, but not necessarily a physical examination of the patient and a review of the patient's relevant medical records. And then we skip down to requirement number 12, the physician wrote the prescription and this would eliminate the, the 48 hour waiting period. So the physician wrote the prescription after the last to occur of certain events and there are certain uh, triggering events there. Then in section two, limitation on actions, um, there are already some protections specifically for the physician, but this would go broader than that to say that no person would be subject to civil or criminal liability or professional disciplinary action for acting in good faith compliance with the provisions of this chapter. Um, so this would, for example, provide immunity for a uh, pharmacist who fills a prescription for the medication, um, given the language of the statute, it's arguably already implicit in there, but this would make it explicit. And then the act would take effect on passage. 
Okay, thank you for going through. So questions on this. Um, this is, this does, this changes the, can you give us the, the, the things that it does to the underlying statute. So it takes away the physical presence of the physician. Takes away the physical presence requirement. It takes away the 48 hour waiting period between the last to occur of the specified um, events. And I can go through those um, with you if you want. I'm just pulling them up right now. Um, so right now the physician must have waited at least 48 hours to write the prescription at least 48 hours after the last to occur of the patient's written request for medication to hasten their death, the patient's second oral request, and the physicians offering the patient an opportunity to rescind the request. So right now it's the prescription then isn't written for another 40, 48 hours after the last of those to occur, this would eliminate that 48 hour waiting period, but still require those three events to have occurred. Um, before writing the prescription. And then it includes a um, broader provision of immunity for people who act in good faith compliance with what's in this section. Uh, Senator Hooker, then Senator Cummings. Thank you. Um, Jen, so the current law requires two requests from the patient? Right, so the... Um, actually it requires three, it requires two oral requests uh, and a written request. And what's the time frame on those? Is it? So uh, the patient must make an oral request, then no fewer than 15 days after the first oral request, the patient makes a second oral request. At that time of the second oral request, the physician offers the patient an opportunity to rescind the request. Uh, and then the patient must also have made a written request for the medication that was signed by the patient in the presence of two or more witnesses who were not interested persons who were at least 18 years old and signed and affirmed that the patient appeared to understand the nature of the document and be free from duress or undue influence when it was signed. And then there are another of, a number of additional provisions that sort of govern the process, um, but the, that's specific to the requests. Senator Cummings, go ahead. And okay. then Senator Hardy. Uh, full disclosure, I voted against the original bill. Um, but the original bill was set up with a lot of guardrails. There was a lot of concern from the disabilities community, um, people, <laughs> the elderly, um, about potential for abuse. Also, one, you know, guardrails, all of these things were there to make sure that people didn't make impulsive decisions. What, pro what problems are we trying to solve? What's come up? Do you know, or is that the I would sponsor? prefer to allow the sponsor, sponsor, the sponsor to tell us. Or, okay. Yeah, yeah that's why we need yep. Senator McCormick in to, to okay. tee up the bill for us. And we'll have him do that as well as others to testify going forward. Uh, I think it's a good question. I just don't yeah, think I'm no, in a it's an excellent question. Uh, Senator Hardy. Um, I, I had a, the same question actually um, as to what spurred this. At first, when I read through it, um, when Senator McCormick sent it out, I thought it was actually related to the COVID provisions, you know, uh, making it remote because of COVID and I was thinking, oh, is this a temporary thing? But I see that's actually not the situation. This would be a more permanent thing. So I would love to hear from him to get an, a, a, sort of what, what's happening out in the field that prompted him um, to do this. Um, and, uh, you know, and also, um, I guess you did just go, my second question was that what were the, the steps and you did just go through the steps, but um, the, so I went through some of the steps. There are a lot of steps in uh, the statute and we did not go through all of those. I'm happy to. Okay. Um, I don't know that I need that now. Maybe we need to right. hear from the sponsor first before we dive into the details, but yes. I'm curious about the, the problem that we're trying to solve with the bill. So yeah, thanks. Yeah, that is, yeah. that is the question. And we will hear from uh, 
the advocates and the, the people who have been working with this uh, program uh, to help us understand. Um, Josh, any comments, questions? Just uh, rereading it as we speak and nothing to add at this time, Senator Lyons, thank you. Okay, all right, that's good. All right. I do so, think it would probably be helpful the next time, you know, when you when you look at it to at least go through what all of the requirements are in statute to so give you a little bit more context for what the changes are. Yes. I think good. without knowing the full process, it's a little hard to conceptualize what removing certain pieces would mean. Yeah, you feel like you're te tearing it all apart. <laughs> yeah, Senator Cummings and I want a flow chart. We were just talking about that yesterday in finance. I like flow charts. You like flow charts. <laughs> oh, I'm no. a words person, so you are not getting a good flow chart from me. I have to hand write something. So A, B, C, D. That's all. <laughs> That's what I've got, A, B, C. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll ask right. some of the witnesses to bring us flow charts. There you go. There you go. There you go. All right. Where this would intercede in the flow chart in red. <laughs> if you want to see flow charts, then you should come to some of my uh, takes one a couple of my courses, then you'd see flow charts. Uh, all right. Any other questions for Jen on this one? So it sounds like we have some uh, questions to be answered going forward, and we'll we'll try to get that in. So. Um, I think we I think we've done sufficient for today unless you have something else that's um, burning. Some of us that started at 815 and have a 12 o'clock meeting would love to have a few minutes. I know, off. ditto. I, I'm in that boat. Okay. Um, Senator Go Lyons, ahead, yeah. one, since we're on, I, I just wanted to let you know I may be a few minutes late to our 12 o'clock meeting. Okay because there's, yeah. I have another, I'm double booked. So I'll That's be there. Okay. <laughs> we start at 1215. So. 1215. Oh, that yeah. might help. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Am I, so, Senator, Senator Lyons, am I missing something at 12 o'clock or 1215? No, 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 you're not. It's the agenda planning piece. <laughs> oh, okay. Thanks. We're just, we're just trying to put things together. Um, or money chairs. Yep. I'm going to let you go, but at, at, at tomorrow, we start at nine o'clock with committee discussion. I, I may have some issues to bring up at that point, and I may also um, have something else scheduled there. But uh, so we'll start at nine, but it'll be a slow start. Okay, and then we're going to dive into S48 uh, and S24. Oh, that'll be a full day. Okay. Thank you all. Good work today. Okay, thank you. Got our first bill out. And Josh, you stick around for a couple minutes. And uh, after we go off, um, off live stream, and we'll just talk. All right.